Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, certainly those of you who are in Europe and uh, good afternoon. I think it's just gone midday in Kampala. So you're all very, very welcome to this webinar on air pollution, urban mobility and governance, organized by the Institute for Sustainability Leadership at the University of Cambridge, that's CISL for short, in conjunction with the University of Birmingham and many partners in Uganda, um, a, a number of which are able to be with us today. Uh, and I'm delighted really to welcome this international cooperation. My name is Jake Reynolds and I'm responsible for research at CISL at the University of Cambridge and I'm pleased to say I do have some familiarity with Uganda having lived in your amazing country in the early 1990s. Kampala of course was a very different city in those days. Cars were comparatively rare and one could reach the central post office I remember from Makere University in less than 10 minutes. I'll let you pause those of you who live in Kampala to think about that. 30 years on, that would be an impossible feat, of course. Kampala's grown and grown like many similar cities, different parts of the world. It's driven a lot of economic development, but have also, it's also attracted its fair share of environmental challenges, not least air pollution. So this webinar brings together a great lineup of Ugandan and international panelists, in academia, policy, business, public health, and social sciences to discuss air quality from a number of different perspectives. Its emergence as a public health threat, the promise and peril of new technologies and solutions, and the state of current and proposed public policy, regulation, and interventions intended to address the air pollution issue in Kampala. The webinar will be recorded for academic purposes, so I just wanted to make you aware of that. So I understand today marks day two of Uganda's Air Quality Awareness Week with the theme of healthy air, important for everyone. A collaborative initiative, as I understand it, from the National Environmental Management Authority, NEMA, Kampala City Council, City Kampala Capital City Authority, KCCA, the US Embassy in Uganda, and a number of other organizations, including AirQuo at Makere University. I'd like to commend those organizations for such a fantastic initiative and hope in some small way that our discussions today may assist with its important work. So our discussion today focuses on the air quality and urban mobility in Kampala, a classic urbanizing African city context and the importance of governance in formulating strategies to deal with what is after all a systemic problem. So if I could sum up our goal today, it would be to bring together the science, technology, health, and policy-making communities to discuss long-lasting solutions to air pollution built on the strongest possible, in fact, global evidence base that will put Kampala and similar cities onto a path to a more prosperous, greener future for all of its citizens. And I emphasize all of its citizens because air quality issues, as we know, do affect adversely uh, communities uh, with lower income levels to a larger extent in many parts of the world. And it is important that we take a very inclusive approach here, I think. Now that's uh, those few words of introduction from me as uh, as your chair today. I did want to pass over to Gabriel Akello, Dr. Gabriel Akello at CISL, just to contextualize the event a little bit more in the Ugandan context, which of course is where he's from. So Gabriel, just a couple of minutes, if I can ask you, just to set the scene from a Ugandan perspective. Thank you very much, Jake. And uh, thanks for everyone who has tuned in to this webinar. Um, I would like to uh, first start by saying, you know, much as uh, the discussion today focuses on uh, Kampala City, which is uh, uh, rapidly urbanizing, it's important to note that the information uh, that will be shared is relevant to many urbanizing of them. And it's estimated by 2030, over 60% of population will be living in cities. So meaning other cities apart from Kampala will also, are also urbanizing towards the level of Kampala. Uh, we need to work towards achieving uh, cities that are not only economically vibrant, uh, like Kampala, 
but also want cities that are socially inclusive and and for Kampala's case, the challenge of uh, urban mobility is, uh, is, is, is growing by the day uh, with the traffic jam and uh, you have uh, the noise within the city. So we hope that uh, this discussion provides uh, some insights on uh, not only the, the, the initiatives taking place in Kampala, but also the interventions that could uh, benefit the city. Thank you very much, Jake. Brilliant, thank you very much, Gabriel. I think that's very, very um, helpful indeed, and just helps us sort of bring, um, bring us all into the same zone before we um, ask our, our panel to share their thoughts. So I won't waste any more time, and I'll ask um, Professor Francis Pope, who's chair of Atmospheric Science at the School of Geography, Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Birmingham here in the UK, to set the scene by exploring for us the science of air pollution. And Francis, um, uh, rather than me attempt, um, you know, long and probably inaccurate descriptions of um, your experience and uh, institution and, 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 and general introduction, perhaps you could just say a couple of words, and perhaps I could encourage each of the panelists to say a couple of words about who they are where they're from before you get started. And I would also remind you that if we can keep to time, then uh, we will have more discussion time later in the webinar. So over to you, Francis. Brilliant, thank you very much, Jake. Can you hear me okay? Can you see my screen? I'll share it now. We can. Uh, brilliant. Um, yeah, it was a real pleasure to be here today. So um, thank you, Jake, for introducing. I'm Francis Pope uh, from University of Birmingham, where I'm a professor of atmospheric science. Um, so as stated, I was asked to set the scene a little bit, uh, and Jake's already done that to a degree, but I'll, I'll, I'll put some further notes on top. Um, so I looked, at the, um, I looked at the ranking of the air pollution in Kampala yesterday afternoon. So this is from the US Embassy regulatory site. Um, and so what it was saying at four o'clock yesterday, that's four o'clock UK time. So I guess that would be six o'clock, seven o'clock uh, Kampala time. That at that moment in time, it was unhealthy for sensitive groups. And we can see this time series as we go through. And so what we can see is yesterday, it was, it was essentially either orange or red. And so it's going between unhealthy for sensitive groups or unhealthy for everyone. So clearly air pollution is a problem in Kampala. Um, and just a snapshot from yesterday, but that, that's very much what we have been seeing. So when we talk about air pollution today, we'll be talking about particulate matter. And I'm sure most people on the call are very happy with this, but just to make sure we're all, um, we're all thinking about the same thing. So particulate matter, these little bits of pollution in the air, little bits of dust and solid and liquids in the air, and they tend to be less than 10 microns in size. So just to give you context, the human hair is about 70 microns. So these are one, the things we're interested in are at least one seventh smaller than the human hair in diameter. And so these bits of particulate matter get smaller and smaller, they get worse and worse for you. So I like this diagram. Um, so the, the big bits, the PM10, they, they tend to get stuck in the upper respiratory tract. They're still problematic, but they don't get too far into the lungs. Once we get smaller to PM2.5, so that's particulate matter less than 2.5 microns in size, so about 1 40th of the human hair, they're then very much getting into the lungs. When we go down smaller to 1 micron, so 70 times smaller, then they're really getting all over the lungs. And then when we get to the really small stuff, the ultrafines, then this is where they can really travel around the body. They can go through the cardiovascular system. They can attack the brain, et cetera. So, that, so most of the health effects of air pollution is because of this particular matter. There are other things to worry about, but I think by and large, what we're talking about today is particulate matter. Um, so I led up a group with many of the people on the call, actually, uh, which was called a systems approach to air pollution in East Africa or ASAP East Africa. And this was funded by DFID, uh, which is now turned into FCDO or the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. So the programme brought together leading UK and East African researchers in various fields to try and think about air pollution holistically. Uh, and, and this is where we met Gabriel through this. So it's been a great pleasure to work with him over the years and there's some of our stakeholders there. Um, so again everyone on the call is probably more au fait with this than I am but just just I think it's really worth thinking about this background so we know that Uganda's population is growing rapidly as is much of South 
sub-Saharan Africa. And, and correspondingly, we're getting these high rates of urbanization, and um, with Kampala being this biggest city, then that really is pushing Kampala's population up. So not only is the population of Kampala going up, the economy is increasing and motorization is increasing, noting what Jake said earlier about the time taken to get to the post office back in the day. Um, and correspondingly, air quality appears to be diminishing. But I think it's really worth thinking about how big Kampala is. So this is just some data from the UN World Population Prospect here. And I know there's question marks about the daytime and the nighttime size of the city. But if we look at the 2010 data, we can see between 2010 and 2020, there's been about 60, 70 percent increase. And if we look at the projections to 2030, then we can see there's almost another doubling of population. And what we have to remember is 2030 is only nine years away. So this is a really, really very significant increase in population. And if each of these people in the city pollute the same amount as the current population, then that air pollution, which is already unhealthy for sensitive groups, unhealthy for all, is going to get worse before it gets better. Um, so one of the troubles um, in Kampala and also in many places around the world, actually, there, there's a lack of historic air pollution data. So we don't really know how the situation has changed. Um, and so one of the things my group's done over the years, it's used visibility as a proxy for air pollution and particular matter air pollution. Um, and so the nice thing about visibility is if you have an international airport, you have to measure visibility to have planes to land. And what visibility is, is just how far can I see? And the more particulate matter you have in the air, the less far you can see. So essentially the, the, the dirtier the air, the, 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 the less you can see. So can I see that mountain or can I not see that mountain, for example? And what we can see here is if we look at Kampala, this is work from um, uh, published late last year. What we can see if we look at Kampala, the black line back in the 70s, the visibility was somewhere between 25 and 30 kilometers on average per year okay and now we go to the current time and it's down the average is around eight kilometers per year okay so there's been this very significant decrease in visibility and correspondingly a significant increase in um in air pollution so it's it seems to be tracking that population increase as you might expect um and so if we can think about this, so the environmental Kuznets curve, and so this, this idea is, is, is disliked by many people, but I think it's a useful thought experiment here. So the environmental Kuznets curve essentially says that the environment initially, as your economy increases, the environment degrades. OK, so we go up the left hand side of that graph. And then at some point, the uh, as the development increases, as the economy increases, then we go down the other side, the environment improves with further development. OK, so we know that Kampala is shooting up the left hand side, or at least it's going up. We don't know if it's going to follow this curve, but we know it's going upwards. And so if we look like somewhere like London, where the worst of our air pollution was back in the 50s, and so maybe that was the worst as bad as it got in the London and because of Clean Air Acts, et cetera, we're now going down here in the UK it's not perfect by any means but we've gone over that hump but we know that Kampala is going up this side so I think the big science question for me at least is how do we reduce that hump is there a way to actually tunnel through this mountain is there a way to get through it using technology etc is there a way not to go through the London smogs so I think that's the big science question for me how do we improve air pollution how do we improve it quickly um, this is just some more data from our group. This is showing, um, this was from 2019 before COVID. Um, and again, this just shows what the US EPA site was showing yesterday. So again, this is the 24 hour data and Kampala compared to Nairobi and Addis seems to be some of the worst air pollution in East Africa. Again, consistently in this unhealthy for everyone or unhealthy for sensitive groups area. And so I put a picture of low cost sensors to the top right here. And so one of the problems was this paucity of data. And so this low cost sensor, this kind of paradigm shift has really made a big difference. And uh, I know we've got a talk from Airquo later and they're really leading the way here, you know, really brilliant work. Um, and so this, this ability to measure air pollution in a cost appropriate way has really made a big difference. So something I'd also say, I think what we now need to start thinking about is source apportionment. So where is the air pollution coming from? We know roughly it's coming from traffic, it's coming from biomass burning, et cetera. But we really need to start being able to pinpoint exactly where it's coming from. So I think that's what's going to happen in the next 
few years. And my final point I want to make is, and this follows on, I guess, with this being Air Quality Awareness Week. So whilst the science is really important, in many ways, the science is relatively easy. The difficult bit is getting people to care, getting people to realise that air quality is this environmental risk. Uh, and so we've done some nice work with uh, Robin Price, who's an international uh, artist. And so what he does is he takes these long exposure photos and then he superimposes the air pollution situation on front of it. And so uh, we've got great coverage with this. We've done work around the world. You'll recognise the, uh, the street scene on the right hand side in the middle of Kampala. So again, this shows how much air pollution is. So it's like putting a microscope up to the air. And that's been very successful in getting people to think about, oh, I'm actually breathing this in. How do I do something about it? And this is just- Thanks. Thank uh, you, Francis. I think we are yep, out, that's of, it. out of time. That's it. Brilliant. All right. Thank you very much, Francis Pope, for that um, introduction to air quality in Kampala. And of course, the um, it just occurred to me as as you were talking about uh, this being a, a challenge for for all. Often it's the the people who have least a say and voice who, of course, are are experiencing air pollution to the worst extent. So I think it would be fantastic if we can uh, bear that in mind all through uh, this webinar about you know who who we're really doing this for and how we are trying to change those curves either. The Kuznick curve and turning the corner at the top, or um, or in general, um, you know, where Kampala um, benchmarks, if you like, in in air quality in different parts of the world. So thank you very much, Francis. And if I could turn now to back to Gabriel. In fact, um, Gabriel is our Prince of Wales Fellow at uh, CRCL, my institution, and um, his work is on air quality and non-communicable diseases, and it's actually supported by. AstraZeneca um, uh, for uh, a period of, of three years in a fairly unique uh, partnership that we have there. So Gabriel, over to you to shed light on the perils and promise of technology in addressing air pollution in Kampala. So moving closer to the solutions, I think. Over to you, Gabriel. Gabriel, do we have you there? Are you on mute? Hello? Can you hear me, Jake? We've got you now. Yeah, is my... And um, we have your screens. We, we have your slide on the screen. You could you could put it into presenter mode if you wish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jake. Yes, um, as Jake mentioned, I'm uh, Gabriel Okello, a uh, research fellow at the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership researching in air quality and non-communicable diseases. Um, my fellowship is uh, funded by AstraZeneca. Just to give you a, a brief preview of uh, my research focus is looking at address uh, non-communicable non disease risk by focusing on uh, air quality through a collaborative approach centered uh, on involvement of uh, stakeholders in academia, policy, business and community in two cities uh, in Uganda. And uh, yeah, Francis just explained a little bit about uh, how the population in Kampala has grown over the last 10 years. Uh, this is just uh, the picture in the slide shows a demonstration of how it is uh, at peak times. That's uh, in the morning, sometimes at lunchtime and the evening in Kampala, you have uh, approximately 2.5 million people commuting daily from the greater metropolitan area, uh, coming into Kampala, within Kampala and out of Kampala. And this has really led to a surge in uh, motorized transport. Um, that's uh, the, the fuel powered motorcycles, which we commonly call the bodies, and the mini buses, which are taxis. And these are usually uh, second-hand reconditioned uh, vehicles um, that are associated with high levels of uh, pollution. But it's fair to say not all the pollution in Kampala is from motorized sources. Uh, some pollution is from industries, uh, waste that is uh, sometimes burnt or left rot in the landfill and uh, biomass used for cooking. Just to give a little bit of context on the effects of air pollution, um, the World Health Organization uh, provides very staggering numbers of 7 million 
deaths globally every year. And in Uganda, we're losing about uh, 30,000 people every year uh, due to air pollution. And you know, living the, the death, besides the death, we're also having uh, the burden of disease from uh, both short-term effects and long-term effects from the cough, the, the pneumonia, the eye irritation to cardiovascular diseases and, and lung cancer. This burden is leading to absenteeism in schools at work, which is reducing productivity and loss of income because people have to treat these diseases. And some of the pollutants uh, like uh, ozone have uh, negative and methane have negative impact to our planet. But uh, what is the promise of technology? Well, uh, the recent uh, proliferation of uh, air quality sensors uh, in Kampala and Uganda at large provides a uh, array of hope as uh, these, these uh, sensors not only provide us with, uh, with, with the location of the hotspot, but they also provide the magnitude of the air pollution. At the moment, Kampala has approximately 100 sensors, both reference monitors and local sensors from Makere Airport and the Kampala Capital City Authority. And there is even an app, uh, an airport app where you can check the, the air pollution around the area where you are. And how significant is this? This is significant in the hotspots as air pollution changes uh, within space and time. We are able also to explore uh, the, how various areas are polluted, but also in future, this will be able to help us to evaluate the effect of the interventions and also drive up citizen science within, uh, within the community. We can see from the, from the graphs below, uh, one graph is showing how air pollution in one place, that's at the US Embassy, changes over time. And the, and the graph on the right is showing how air pollution is different in different places within Kampala. And it's different on different days. From the data that we have, uh, we know that uh, the fine particulate that Francis talked about, uh, we are five times above the, the WHO required uh, recommended levels. So that is really way above. And we've gone ahead recently with a pilot uh, in collaboration with the uh, Makere Airport and uh, University of Colorado to try and establish what are the sources of this air pollution. And the stage we are at now is uh, showing that slightly over half of them come from combustion sources, including vehicles and cooking. And then the other half is coming from the dust. Uh, those would be the untamped roads. However, some interventions are taking place in Kampala. We have the Namirebe Room Street Corridor, which was converted to non-motorized by the Kampala Capital City Authority. We also have the rail transport that transport that uh, transports people from Kampala to Namambe. And we're also having uh, the soon to be launched uh, air quality standards that will provide guidance on vehicular emissions. Another promise of technology is uh, it is the electric mobility or the e-borders and these are in their pilot phase in Kampala with the various companies trying to explore how how this can be adopted uh, within Kampala other companies are, are converting the already existing fuel powered motorcycles into electric whereas uh, others are outrightly importing electric motorbikes and it will be interesting to see the impact of uh, adoption of uh, these uh, e-borders. We also have the cars, our own Kira Motors Corporation is doing a bit of pilots on the on the Kayola bus and recently Nissan is also uh, is also importing into the country electric vehicles. But is it only is it only technology that will solve this? Um, I think that that is still a big question. As uh, addressing air pollution involves uh, societal change, which clearly calls for involvement uh, from various stakeholders. For example, with the e-borders, uh, it's very important to involve the border border riders themselves, uh, other transport sectors like the Ministry of Works, to try and harness uh, the complex issues 
and also the advantages and inherent trade-offs of adopting such interventions. Now, as I, as I conclude, I would like to reflect on the past couple of months uh, with the massive disruption of COVID and the, and the lockdown with all those negative impacts. One of the takeaways from those past couple of months is that we saw a very unprecedented collaboration uh, in not only in Uganda, but in many countries, especially in Uganda, we had uh, different ministries lending the Ministry of Health cards for, for transporting um, food to different areas. We had different people contributing uh, food, contributing uh, medical supplies, etc. That level of collaboration was so unprecedented that it, it, someone would never have thought of it pre-COVID. They also, there was some experience of what the air would what, what benefit would have in addressing air pollution? We had a drop in particulate uh, matter concentrations by 45 to 55%, and also we had uh, a drop in uh, nitrogen oxides. There's massive awareness. What do I take away from the past 12 months that tackling such complex issues um, like air pollution requires uh, massive disruption and tremendous collaboration across silos? Thank you, Gabriel. Very, very, uh, very, very useful indeed. And uh, it's really good to hear about the um, uh, the pandemic response and the collaboration that that bred, and the hope, I, I guess, that uh, one can find in uh, new ways of working and uh, and, and working towards longer term uh, vision. For example, a, a, a prosperous and cleaner Kampala. So um, wonderful to get those uh, those inputs about some of the solutions there and. In fact, um, what I'd like to do is is invite um, Immaculate uh, Niamesi from the Ministry of Works and Transport, where she's Senior Vehicles Inspector, to help us understand about the government's strategies to manage transport-related air pollution in Uganda. And, and Immaculate, um, you know, it, it, the focus today is on is on mobility and. Uh, Gabriel mentioned uh, older boaters, which I understand there is a very large number, um, something like 250,000. So clearly there's, that is part uh, and other forms of uh, mobility are part of the air pollution issue. It's not the only part, of course, cooking and, <clears throat> and waste burning and, and industry, of course, are all there too. But help us understand, if, if you can, Immaculate, what, how the government sees this and um, you know, what, what its sort of longer range thinking is about getting uh, a grip on this problem of air pollution. Thank you. Okay, good morning and afternoon to everyone. Um, um, my name is Immaculate Nyamezi. I work with Ministry of Works and Transport. Can you see my screen? We, we can, Immaculate, yes. It's if you, yeah. if you wanted to press presenter mode, we'd, we'd see it probably a little bit more clearly, but it's very visible. Okay. So straight away, I'll talk about Uganda's transport sector overview. It's a landlocked country with, of course, around uh, 46 million people. The total number of vehicles is around 2 million, including motorcycles. And uh, the biggest percentage, the biggest vehicle percentage, around 60% is in Kampala. The big, the major means of transport, we mainly have uh, 14 seater minibuses and border borders and buses which work with around the city. The transport sector is mainly steered by Ministry of Works and Transport. Other key holders, we have Uganda National Roads Authority, we have the Uganda Railway Corporation. Kampala Capital City Authority. Yeah, we are to focus on road transport. All the vehicles currently that are in our country are imported, both brand new and used vehicles. We import around 70,000 motor vehicles and around 1,000 motorcycles per annum. Of the brand new vehicles imported, you find that 10% are procured by government and embassies and non-government organizations and those are usually between one to two years one to four years the rest of the cars 
I used vehicles. Most of our used vehicles come from Japan, Singapore, South Africa, United Arab Emirates, and the United Kingdom. And according to a baseline study that was done by Ministry of Energy in 2018, the average age of the petrol vehicles is around 15.4 years, and the diesel vehicles around 16.4. But this was before we put an age limit to vehicles. So currently, this is what Kampala looks like on a daily basis. We have an intermodal kind of transport. We find pedestrians, motorcycles, minibuses, buses, all sharing the same road. And it's an everyday scene in Kampala. So far, the government has put some regulations in place to manage motor vehicles and also manage air pollution. We have the Code of Practice for Inspection and Testing of Used Vehicles for Roadworthiness 2017. We have the Traffic and Road Safety Motor Vehicle Inspection Regulation 2016. We have the Traffic and Road Safety Act 1998 Amendment Act 2020. This one was recently amended. And we are waiting for NEMA to finalize the air quality regulations. Now, in 2009, Uganda, because we wanted to get rid of old vehicles, hoping that they would. Uh... Yeah. Hello. Immaculate, we have um, we've lost you. Hello. If you can hear us, Immaculate, I don't know if you want to unplug your mic and try again or... Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now, yeah. Yeah. So, the government of Uganda introduced an environmental levy of 20% surcharge in 2009 on cars that are older than eight years within an, with an aim of reducing old cars. It came that if a car is below five years, there will be zero taxes. If it's between six and 10 years, it would pay 35% of the CFI value. And if it's above 10 years, it would pay 50%. However, this hasn't been deterrent enough in stopping old vehicles from coming into, from coming into the country. This is because... Uh, this is because the CFI value of older cars is low relative to that one of buying new cars. And you find that uh, a very small portion of Ugandans can afford to buy a brand new car. Um, on 1st of October 2018, the Uganda Revenue Authority moved, a move, moved to effect a ban on importation of motor vehicles, which are over 15 years from date of manufacture. However, this ban is only applicable to, to saloon cars and public service vehicles. It doesn't apply to road tractors or goods vehicles with a gross weight of at least six tons going upwards all special purpose vehicles like breakdown vehicles, concrete mixers, and armored fighting vehicles. So it's not so effective. We had already introduced a mandatory motor vehicle inspection scheme that was running under SGS, under private public partnership, but it hasn't been successful due to some political challenges. And of course, we cannot talk about vehicle standards without talking about fuel standards. Uganda adopted the, 20, the January 2015 low sulfur fuel standards for which for East Africa, which allow a maximum content of 50 parts per million for diesel, vehicle, for diesel fuel and 150 parts per million for gasoline. And of, we have also started constructing an assembly plant for vehicles. 
especially um, our electric vehicles, but the plant, the construction is 60% com complete. We hope to kick off by 2023. And there's also a proposal to have a vehicle recycling industry established in Uganda to manage the old and decommissioned vehicles. We hope this can be used for spare parts and repair, as well as scrap metal for other recyclable parts. We hope this will go a long way in eliminating emissions associated with cars. Now, in October 2012, the Ministry of Works and Transport published a standalone a standalone non-motorized transport policy, which notes that NMT is the popular means of transport in Uganda and yet the most unsafe. And in this policy, we hope to achieve the objectives of increasing walking and cycling, as well as making it safer for pedestrians and cyclists to, to walk. So far, we have a pilot study that has been done on Namirembe Road. We haven't yet carried out a, a study to see how successful this has been, but at least now a number of people are cycling, the people who use this corridor. And I think it's a good project. We have also incorporated this NMT policy in most of the new roads that have been redesigned in Kampala. You can see the green stretch shows the cyclist lane while the other pavements is And of course, the factors which determine levels of, oil, of emission include the quality of fuel imported and the used vehicles, the quality of vehicles, the enforcement of vehicle emission standards, the frequency of use, and this is what now the government of Uganda has done so far. We have. Uh, yeah, please. We have I think you have one about one minute left. If if I could just remind you, thank you. Okay, please just give me a few more minutes, like five. We have uh, air quality regulations. We have the non-motorized routes that have been developed. We have this Kira EV, the black vehicle, is an electric car. And the white bus you see is a solar powered bus, it runs on solar batteries, all being done by Kira Motors, which is completely a Ugandan company. We have air quality monitoring systems in Kampala. We have a vehicle edge limit now, which we didn't have previously. And we have more roads that are being paved in Kampala. Now, the future interventions is that uh, we have. A, a BRT study was, a paratransit study was completed last year in November. And currently what is taking place is that they're implementing the recommendations of the paratransit study, which included forming an apex body for the management of the bus rapid transport. We have also developed terms of reference for the technical support to review the proposed designs with assistance from the World Bank. The plans are underway to revamp the passenger train services in Kampala. Before COVID, um, the passenger train has five coaches and one locomotive, and it was carrying 4,000 passengers on a daily basis from Namambe to Kampala. But because of COVID, the number has reduced. Now it is carrying two, between 2,000 to 2,500 passengers on a daily. But plans are underway to rehabilitate the 10 coaches and also increase the number of locomotives to two and also expand the passenger train services to other areas in the Kampala metropolitan area. We have plans to assemble hybrid, budge, hybrid electric buses for mass transport. And we also want to reduce the vehicle age to eight years. And we are also rehabilitating the meter gauge railway. The contract already has been approved by cabinet and he's just mobilizing resources to start doing the job. And we are also doing what? 
the number of signaled junctions is going to increase in Kampala. But of however, there are challenges in all this. Applying safety and emission standards to, without enforcing is a challenge. We have there is no proper verification of results of pre-shipment inspection at the point of entry in Uganda, not even at that time of vehicle purchase. We lack information regarding fuel efficiencies of imported vehicles. You find that most of these imported vehicles come with manuals in Japanese, everything is written in Japanese, so you really can't know the fuel efficiency of that car. The land system system in Uganda also leads to high resettlement costs in case you need to increase, you know, in case, like for BRIT's case, it is, it, is, it is very costly for Uganda because we have to compensate people. And of course, there are political challenges. Thank you, Immaculate. Um, I think we need to wrap up very shortly. Did you have a final word or? Um, no, it's time up. It's okay. Okay, thank you very much, Amaka. That was really amazing. The, the range of um, the range of activities underway through the uh, the Ministry of Transport and Works, and um, uh, in combination, I'm sure will make a, a substantial difference. Um, it crossed my mind as you were speaking that the transition from petrol and diesel engines to electric mobility, which um, in some parts of the world has now been um, for example, in the UK, we, we brought forward the date by which no um, vehicles will be sold, which are not, um, which, which are diesel or electric or diesel or petrol powered to 2030. These kinds of transitions are um, are hopefully not only able to accelerate uh, the air, air pollution solution, but also to create jobs. And I'm thinking that a lot of the things which you've described in your presentation, Immaculate, may also be uh, part of what we might call a green economy or green uh, helping <clears throat> helping citizens to develop skills which are actually very important for the future and, and could be very economically um, very economically advantageous for those individuals and for the <clears throat> for the city as a whole so lots of good stuff there um, mm -hmm. if I may move on to um, Paul Green uh, Paul is technical manager at McCary Airquo, which has been referenced uh, many times already in this webinar. And Paul, I think you're going to talk us through the relationship between air quality and mobility in Kampala, and interestingly, some neighbouring towns as well. So over to you, Paul. Uh, can you hear me and see the screen? Okay. We can. We can do both, Paul. We have you. Fantastic. Okay. All right, great. So thanks very much for having me. I'll try to move through things fairly swiftly as I'm conscious, Jake, of the, of the pressures on you. Um, so, yeah, as, as you said, we've heard quite a bit about what AirCo does. We're a Google-funded air quality monitoring program operating out of Kampala. Um, we try to solve the challenge of there being this big data gap where historically we haven't known what's happening with air quality in African cities because the monitoring just hasn't been there. So we wanted to solve that problem by introducing low cost sensors, um, but also recognizing that even then, uh, the, the number of sensors that would be involved, there's still a high cost element. So the goal of our project is to use AI, machine learning, and other technology, which was supported by Google, to kind of power up these low cost devices so that we can get a really good understanding of what's happening with air quality without having to spend a huge amount on high cost, expensive infrastructure. So we're getting there. Um, our activities therefore involve building our own low cost sensors customized to the local environment, calibrating them against a few selected reference sensors, including the US Embassy and a couple of our own, but not huge numbers. Um, and from that building the spatial and temporal models, which will help um, understanding. So the key part of the project though, is that it's about impact. It's not just about collecting data, passing it to government or for academic study. It's about actually using the data to inform, uh, to create actionable insights, to encourage all decision makers, whether they're families or whether they're government ministers, to use air quality data in making day-to-day -day decisions. Um, okay, so this is, uh, there's many things that I could talk about. We're just gonna talk about uh, a, 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 what, what we would call a think piece, just to 
explore some of the issues relating to how mobility is captured by air quality. So we're looking at these select sensors. So those of you who are familiar, here's Kampala. Uh, the two closest towns that it connects with are Jinja. This road that you see going out to the west to pass Jinja actually connects Uganda to Kenya and to many of the, the ports, Mombasa, Dar es Salaam. So a huge amount of traffic and commerce uh, will pass along these roads. So we have the kind of Kampala capital city. We've got these transit roads, uh, Jinja over here with a lot of industry and, and international traffic. And then down here we have Entebbe, which those of you who have visited will know is, is where the airport is located. So there's not a lot of through traffic there, but similarly there is still quite a bit of, of movement between the two towns. So just looking in slightly more detail, we've got devices that we're looking at going around uh, what I've called the orbital road. So this comprises the northern bypass going over the top here, Ginger Road along the southeast, and then some just moving along this southern bit here, contrasting to some that are in the, some devices in the city centre. So we've got a selection, orbital roads, Campana city centre, transit roads between the other cities, and devices located in those cities themselves. Okay, so uh, this graph has been seen shared by a few people just to give an impression. So we have what we call a diurnal variation. So how much does the air quality vary over the course of the day? Um, and what you can see, so that the orbital of those road is that kind of ring road that I was speaking about before is the, the top level. Then we've got the transit roads, the green and the orange between Entebbe and Kampala, Kampala and Jinja. And then down at the bottom, we've got Jinja and Entebbe themselves. So we just want to spend a little bit of time, depending on the, the knowledge that different um, viewers might have, is to think a bit about this shape. Because if we, there's a very clear wave here, and you've seen that, that, that image um, on several presentations. So very often when this is presented to people for the first time, they'll say, it's obvious this is to do with rush hour traffic. You can see that you have a peak in the morning, six, seven, eight, nine, that makes sense. And then you have another one at the end of the day, five, six, seven, eight. Um, so that's that, that explains it. But when you actually stop and you come to think of it, anybody who's actually spent any time in Kampala will know that it's not the case that traffic happens between six, seven and eight. Everybody then goes into their office and works away and the streets are deserted for most of the day before five o'clock when they come out again and, and rush home. It really doesn't follow that pattern uh, empirically. Plus, when you look at it, you know, seven o'clock, maybe a little bit early to be doing that traveling and, and eight or nine o'clock at night, perhaps that's a little bit after. So. Although that gives um, a, a first impression and perhaps it satisfies a few people, it's something that we need to look at in more detail because that pattern is there, whether we're looking at small rural towns or, uh, well, sorry, smaller towns or, um, or transit roads. So let's have a little bit of a look. We just wanted to get a, you know, a general idea and think about what might be going on. Okay, so one way we wanted to do this is to try and capture the level of traffic activity. So one challenging way of doing that would be to go out with counters, um, literally counting the number of trucks, bikes, speed that they're moving and all that kind of thing. That's impractical at any level. So if you've ever been on Google Maps and you switch on the traffic app, you can see that we have um, different colours to capture the levels of traffic activity at different points in the city. So the green shows that there is traffic, but that it's moving swiftly, like there's no, there's no congestion, but there are cars on the roads. Orange means it's starting to slow down. Red means it's really congested. And burgundy, which I'm not sure we've got too much of on here, but burgundy pretty much demonstrates gridlock. So Google doesn't share the, you know, the full details about what that means. They capture this information by monitoring the speed of GPS systems for all of those you know, mobile phones that are sitting in vehicles. So the more, the more mobile phones are being used, the more accurate this data becomes. So we set up a relatively simple tool to take screenshots and to actually count the number of pixels at different times in the day, like an hourly basis during the day to see how that changed, see how the, how the congestion picture changed. This is an example, this is actually 10 p.m. on a Monday. You can see that there are certainly hotspots and a lot of those hotspots are around that orbital road that we mentioned. This green line here, this is Kampala and Tebi Expressway, beautiful road, lovely and green. Um, it has some challenges of its own like people are quite nervous about it because if you break down there's not really anything nearby that can help you there's no way off 
Um, but yeah, so let's have a look at what we what we found. So we took 100% represents the maximum road uh, road uh, occupancy that we saw. So you can see here on a typical day between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m., the roads across Campania are operating at pretty close to the busiest they've ever been. The roads are full. This is this green line shows whether they're there are cars at all, whether they're fast moving, slow moving, or whatever. Uh, so the, the, the roads are packed at any time. It's not like there are these empty highways with not much happening. This orange line, though, is perhaps the more interesting one. So this is all slow moving traffic. So those are the orange, the red, and the burgundy. And you can see that far from having that uh, sine wave kind of shape that we saw uh, with the air pollution, we can see that from 6 a.m. it starts, steadily increases, bit busier at lunchtime, maybe a little dip in the afternoon, um, where roads are up, 20% of roads are around uh, uh, slow moving. But by the time we get up to 8 p.m., 8 and 9 p.m., we can see that that's nearly 50% of the roads in Kampala are slow moving. So it's not to do with that, you know, evening rush. Um, we've got some really interesting things going on, um, but this is the peak time of the day when it comes to slow, slow moving traffic. When we look at the different um, areas, so that area between Jinja and Kampala, that has a really different pattern. You can see it's got this peak, uh, it's quite high already at 6 a.m. It's got 40% of the roads are, are slow moving, quite high at midday as well, but then drops off towards the end of the afternoon. Specu this is an area for further research, but I suspect it's to do with traffic patterns, both traveling between Jinja and Kampala, but also you know, when the borders open, when, when the sun comes up and how long it takes a truck to get from uh, the border with Kenya to Jinja to Kampala. Fascinating um, about the, the movements of traffic, but um, there's a lot more work to be done there. And then um, Entebbe Kampala, pretty low for large parts of the day. Remember, this is a quieter route. It sees a peak at around 9 or 10 o'clock. But I'm, I'm thinking that this isn't actually to do with weight of congestion. Most of the flights that leave Entebbe leave around... 11 or 12 o'clock at night. So there's, there's actually quite a bit of congestion just queuing up to go into the airport. So I suspect that on a relatively quiet you know, part of the country, a lot of that uh, relies on, on the airport. So there's lots of fun stuff to do, lots of exploration. Um, but what's going on? How do we explain it? How can we explain that we've got this increasing traffic that, that, in, that goes up across the day, um, but at the same time, we've got that curve shape where we've got that dip. Uh, in the middle of the day that makes it look like everybody's gone away. So um, I think part Francis alluded to some of this in 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 really simple terms, and I'm no uh, meteorology expert or atmospheric chemist myself, but when air is cool, uh, it drops and the pollution drops and hovers around ground level. So at cool times, particularly overnight, early morning, late at night, you have air settling around ground level so the pollution is denser. As the sun comes up in the morning, that cool air starts to rise and filter up into the higher parts of the atmosphere, which means the concentration at ground level is lower. So at the highest part of the day, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, when it's hottest, you see that concentrations appear to be much lower. But that isn't actually because the emissions are lower at that time. It's because all of those emissions are there, they're just higher up in the atmosphere. And it's only when it starts to cool at four, five, six o'clock in the evening that you see that pollution that's been high up drop down and start to really hang around the street and, uh, and household level. And unfortunately, that seems to coincide with exactly the same time that we've got high levels of traffic. So that oh, is can I, can I is... just um, <clears throat> Can I just give you a, a one minute there? Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Um, yeah, so, so we've got a similar pattern going on going on throughout. So just a few, three insights that I have, brief ones that we can, that we can finish on. So we need to look at the systems, the, what's happening between roads that connect different cities and what's happening in, on, orbital, on the orbital road that um, haulage and, and uh, commuters are going to use to get around the city need to be looked at in much more detail because that seems to be where areas are, um, are the worst. We talk about the northern bypass, but if you see this map in the top right hand corner, you can see it's not really a bypass. It bypasses the center, but it by no means bypasses the city. So if I'm traveling from 
uh, Mombasa to, to Kigali, I'm going to go pretty much through, through Kampala. I'm not bypassing at all. So those interactions are still worth exploring. Another thing that really is interesting for me is that idea of nighttime exposure. We saw in all of those at that nine, 10 o'clock sweet spot where not only is traffic at its worst, but also um, uh, we've got that, that boundary layer, the air, the, the air is cooling and it's descending again, means that nighttime is actually the time of greatest exposure. But are we thinking about households, you know, trying to protect themselves from, from air pollution at that time of day rather than during in the day? And the final thought is, are we, you know, is traffic actually the whole story? If you look at the, the structure of Kampala, it's quite hilly. So roads are built going through valleys. So perhaps there's an issue of a valley. Valleys contain water. Water is often useful for industry. Where there's industry, there tends to be uh, fairly low, low cost housing, lower socioeconomic groups. And you can see that the, the slum or informal settlement areas tend to be around that area. Roads also attract a lot of hawkers and street food and cooking and that kind of thing. So although we're identifying these issues with roads, there's more work to be done to see if it's actually roads or if it's actually vehicles or something else. So there's a lot of issues raised, um, so much more to go into, but I just want to give you a flavor of some of the things that the data was showing up. Thank you very much. Super, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. What, a, what an absolutely amazing tool. And um, <clears throat> if you recall back to the goal that I um, provided at the start of this webinar about informing the process of policy development and also business action. I think this kind of platform clearly is uh, is, is remarkably um, able to do that. And I, I imagine as it as it evolves further, will become an absolutely indispensable tool to uh, transport planners and in fact, air quality planners uh, generally in Uganda and, and who knows elsewhere too. So thank you very much, Paul. Um, I mean, one of the, it's a sort of nice segue to uh, Jennifer um, Kutisakwe, who's the Senior Environmental Officer at the National Environmental Management Authority, or NEMA. Um, Jennifer, you're going to tell us about NEMA's role in managing air quality in Uganda and perhaps um, update us on the air quality regulations. And it'd be wonderful if you could also um, reflect on how uh, tools like the uh, approach we've just seen from AirQuo could potentially assist in the development of these uh, these regulations and perhaps the monitoring of that follows them as well. So, Jennifer, if I can hand over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would thank you so much. Uh, I would request for my screen to be shared. Might want to close. Uh, sorry, uh, I would request Gabriel to share my screen or any other person. Uh, not not to share my screen to share my presentation. We can we can see your presentation, Jennifer. It's but it's tucked away behind a little box yeah. from oh, Microsoft oh. Office. Uh, are you able to see it now? We can yes, we can see it now. And maybe if you if you wanted to click on the um, presentation mode, it might be a little bit clearer for us all. But we can see it, yes, Jennifer. You can you can see. Okay. We right. can. So. Okay. So um, my name is Jennifer Desafe, and I work with the National Environment Management Authority as a senior environment inspector. Yeah, I'm so excited to be part of this team and for giving me an opportunity to share um, what we've been doing as the National Environment Management Authority. Uh, a number of, of you have taken part in the development of the air quality uh, standards for Uganda and regulations uh, like <coughs> COP. Yeah, uh, Gabriel, Paul Green, uh, from behind, uh, you know, some of you have really supported us and we are so excited about the support. Some of you have provided comments and we are so excited and we are almost through with the development of the air quality standards for Uganda, which uh, has been a draft since 2015. So we are, are seeing us, uh, 
you know, coming up with this document, it, 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 is, it is such a blessing and it gives us uh, the hope that we are going to, to improve uh, the air quality situation in Uganda because it is hard to, to do that if you don't have a regulation in place. So my presentation is uh, oh, uh, the role of NEMA uh, involvement of the air quality uh, standards and regulation. So as NEMA, we are mandated by the Act of Parliament to develop standards and guidelines for environmental management. So in doing this, we contribute to the, the, to the government development goals and we protect the lives of, of all people of Uganda. <clears throat> so, um, and our role is gotten from the act, the mandate that we are given by parliament to do that. So we've been developing this regulation, but uh, of course uh, there has been limited expertise in development of the air, uh, air quality uh, standards and regulations. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, because of the limited expertise in the country, we had to source for different comments for various people to support us uh, in this process. So we've had the number of, of, of people, like I said, Pope provided some comments and Pope uh, yeah, provided some comments and a number of you guys who provided or who worked with us throughout this process. And we are almost, we are almost, we are almost there. It's almost done. So we we've been working through it, especially through the COVID uh, lockdown time since March up to now. We are still refining and ensuring that what comes out is the best for our country. So basically, there are several sources of air pollution. The, the, pic, the picture shows uh, a, a factory inside the factory where uh, emissions are produced, and such emissions uh, they normally go. Uh, they are released without any form of treatment, and they cause, uh, as a result, they cause pollution to the surrounding environment. So the law that we are making looks at at several aspects. Uh, it looks at the industries. Uh, we have uh, the ambient air quality standards. Yeah, we have, uh, <clears throat> just a second, we have the ambient air quality standards, then we have the industrial emissions. Uh, uh, these are limits beyond which industries should not exceed the emissions, uh, we, we attached numeric values to these, uh, to several parameters that are likely to come out of, uh, of, 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 of an industry. And the industries have been categorized depending on the kind of processes that they are involved in. And then we have attached numeric values for emissions. And then we have also standards for protection of public health which fall under ambient air quality standards. So we have ambient, then we have industrial emissions. Then we have another part which speaks to, to vehicular emissions. Uh, like my colleague from the Ministry of Works has, has, has said, we've worked with them in the, develop, in the development of this standard. And uh, we, in this vehicle emission standard, we are looking at Euro 4 standard as our comparative standard. So all East African countries are uh, all towards achieving, we all work towards achieving uh, Euro 4 standard of emission limits. So currently we are looking at Euro 4, then after five years, we are going to change and, and go to Euro 6. So that's how we are going to move every, after five years, we will be changing the standard of the vehicle emissions. So that's how we've been working. And then also the, the regulation, the air quality regulation also has a part that speaks to occupational health and safety standards. And this will, this, this basically helps, uh, it, it will be applicable uh, in uh, industries, in uh, offices where people, 
or the public is exposed to emissions that could probably harm them. And as NEMA, we are mandated to protect Ugandans and the lives of every Ugandan to ensure that they live in a healthy and clean environment. So we are making these standards for occupational health and safety, exposure, but it will be the mandate of the occupational health and safety department to enforce. But NEMA is mandated to make the standard, but other institutions will be given the mandate to do the enforcement. So we may not come in to take occupational health and safety measurements, but we will require the, the, the department where this falls to do the enforcement of this standard. The same way, is, the similar thing is going to happen with the vehicle emissions. Uh, where I will require Minister of Works to Minister of Works to, to do the enforcement of this standard. They will be required to 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 to, to routinely uh, do checks on every vehicle in Uganda and issue them with uh, permits or licenses or or certificates. I don't know, but we will require that the ministry that is responsible. Uh, for vehicle inspections to do the enforcement of this standard on vehicle emissions. We are mandated by law to coordinate. So we are, will work with the Ministry of Works to make sure to make sure that this uh, standard is, is, is enforced. So that's how we're going to work. That's how we've been working and the development of this standard has been through a consultative process. We've consulted several, several standards which includes the World Health Organization uh, guidelines and standards. Then we looked at uh, uh, World Bank IFC standards. We looked at Euro, the Euro uh, Air Quality Directive. Then we looked at the EPA, the environmental, uh, the American uh, US EPA uh, standards. We looked at the South African air quality standards. We looked at the Kenya air, uh, air quality standards and the East African air quality standards. So the process has been so consultative and we've, we've engaged various experts uh, in this process. And uh, we, we, we are still, we, we are almost there, but we can still share and welcome comments from uh, various experts still. Uh, uh, until we finally say uh, it is the, the process is closed, but we hope to to have this regulation passed by uh, end of June. So end of June, the regulation will be in place for air quality, and we'll be happy to share to share it with uh, uh, most of you. Yeah, and Gabriel, uh, who is the part of this team, has been very instrumental, especially in the development of the of the uh, occupational health and safety standards uh, he was one of the key people that were involved in this so and he came in as uh, uh, on the part of the public civil society organization yeah so he came in to lead this process and he worked together with the occupational health and safety department and even nema was involved and then we came up with this with the, the, the limits, the exposure limits for over uh, uh, 500 parameters. Yeah. So, uh, Jennifer, um, sorry, sorry to stop you, Jennifer. Um, could I just ask you to wrap up within within one minute, please, if that's possible? Within one minute. Okay. Fine, 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 fine. So, I've already talked about how the, 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 the air quality uh, standard and regulation was formulated through a consultative process. And then, um, yeah, the enforcement bit, uh, the different uh, government institutions, ambient air quality will be enforced. The ambient air quality standards will be enforced by NEMA. And then uh, vehicle emissions is the mandate of Ministry of Works and Transport, Occupational Health and, and Safety. It is the Occupational Health and Safety Department that will do the enforcement bit of it. Yeah, <clears throat> then um, finally, yes, we hope that the enforcement of these standards 
plus other deliberative efforts that uh, uh, yeah, the, plus other deliberate efforts would be useful in reducing air pollution generated from various sources. I thank you. Thank you so much for listening to me. That's wonderful, Jennifer. Thank you so much for bringing us up to date and uh, uh, your patient explanation there about how the the, the system um, of institutions in the government um, is is jointly responsible for this and how they work together. So that that was really good. I mean, you have your work cut out. There's a, there's of course a huge uh, challenge out there in terms of air quality, but good to know the standards are on their way. Um, and also good to know that you're, you're, you're you know you're borrowing and interacting with other parts of the world that are facing similar challenges because I think that's that kind of cooperation is is really at the heart of this. It's also interesting I think to see that um, you know even based around the presentations today and I'm sure many others working in this area there really does seem to be a community emerging uh, in in Uganda of people with uh, different lenses on the problem different capabilities they're offering whether it's analytical and data or or engagement or some of the underlying science and of course the policy and regulation and the business sides uh, so that's all very hopeful um, if I may I would like to move on now to uh, Dr William Avis uh, a research fellow at the University of Birmingham um, and also um, his colleague Alison is it Alison Brown who is a professor at Cardiff University who are jointly going to uh, provide the, the final presentation for us this afternoon on the role of societal factors in air quality so um, William and Alison, the floor is yours. If I could ask you to uh, keep uh, as far as possible to time, then we may have just a little moment at the end of the session to invite questions. So over to you, William. Excellent, thank you. I'll go through this as quickly as possible and uh, prompt Alison when it's her time to come in. So Alison and I have been invited today to reflect on the social impacts of air pollution and the extent to which societal factors may affect efforts to address this issue. Uh, I'll start with the general and then move on to a, to a discussion of a study that we have collectively pulled together. As noted earlier, uh, air pollution causes around 7 million deaths every year and the cost associated with this health damage from ambient air pollution is estimated to be $5.7 trillion, equivalent to 4.8% of global GDP. Given the above, concerns about air pollution are increasingly rising up the political agenda in many countries. Examples can be drawn from Bulgaria, where citizen campaigns prompted a mayoral debate, in the UK, where politicians are encouraged to act, and in Uganda at both local and national levels. Uh, in the Ugandan context, issues around air quality were mentioned in the NRM 2126 manifesto, including commitments to reduce biomass use and to monitor and benchmark environmental indicators for cities. Uh, in terms of social impacts, it's important to consider the following. Uh, whilst air pollution is considered to impact on all groups, particularly when exposed over prolonged periods of time, some groups are considered to be more susceptible than others. Here we can think about the young, the old, those who work in polluting industries, or those from low socioeconomic status. It's also important to consider how exposure to and perception of air pollution will vary between groups, for example, between those whose exposure is a result of their occupation, or for those who may be relatively removed from sources of air pollution, but consider the issue an area of concern for a range of other reasons, whether age, ill health, being a parent. Finally, it is also important to consider how attempts to address air quality issues, they also impact on groups in different ways, both negatively and positively. Here, issues around affordability, availability, acceptability of interventions are important. I'll now pass over to Alison to talk a little bit about this study. So my interest is in urban livelihoods, in street vendors and people, boda boda riders. And we have to ask the question, what's it like to live in an air pollution hotspot? 
the big trend data is important, but, but how do we raise awareness and what can we do about it? Barboda riders are polluters from their engines, but they also sit in dirty traffic every day. And as long as ago as 2017, the Daily Monitor in Kampala carried articles on the impact of air pollution on Kampala's streets. And that was highlighting a WHO study in 2016, which ranked Kampala as one of the most polluted cities in the African continent. Um, also highlighting the work of our collaborator, Dr. Bruce Kirenge of the Makerere Lung Institute. But this is what Boda Boda riders and many others face on a daily basis. This is a photograph that I took of waste recycling at the Katezi landfill uh, site. So here we have a problem of those three different types of, of air pollution that was mentioned by Gabriel right at the beginning of dust and of traffic fumes and also of biomass. And really very little is known about occupational exposure to air pollution, which is why the study led by Francis Pope at Birmingham University is so important in improving our understanding and awareness. And I think what, we've, what we have in Kampala is some very, in, some good data, some very enlightened ministries, but our critical question is how you translate that into action. So I'm just going to hand back over to William again. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about a forthcoming study that illustrates the complexity of addressing the causes and consequences of air pollution. This study reflected on the role of Boda Boda in Kampala, the extent to which the proliferation of motorcycles is impacting on air quality as well as on the health of riders and others, and also reflects on the extent to which efforts to address the air quality must be nested within a broader range of interventions to support improvements to transport within Kampala. Uh, in many city, motorcycles are an important transport mode addressing mobility needs. Drivers of the proliferation of motorcycles include population growth, inadequate road infrastructure, and declining formal bus services. Uh, in many Estimates of the number of Boda Boda in Kampala suggest a figure of up to or over 250,000, forming up to 40% of vehicles on particular sections of roads. Motorcycles also offer a range of employment opportunities, including riding, repairs, spare parts dealing, and also a source of revenue for uh, city and national government from taxation, licensing, etc. It's also important to reflect on the political power of uh, representative organizations such as the National Federation for Boda Boda Riders, which in 2007 had over 70,000 members and therefore exerted a significant amount of political influence. So Boda Boda Riders are both contributors to and victims of air pollution. Findings from a spot measurement campaign conducted by the ASAP research team highlighted that riders are exposed to unhealthy levels of air pollution between 40 to 63% of the working day. Uh, the map on the image shows reported levels of air pollution as the rider moved around the city. And the graph shows the percentage of time riders spent in different levels of air pollution. And when interviewed, riders reported high levels of respiratory illnesses and reported issues around skin and eye irritation, often associated with air pollution exposure. What this study did is highlight that a central part problem for Boda Boda riders is that air pollution can only be effectively addressed as part of a wider transport strategy, one that addresses the transport needs of a range of income groups, uh, that tackles Kampala's endemic congestion, and supports the livelihoods and well-being of riders and their dependents. I'll now pass back over to Alison for our final couple of slides. So we've talked a lot about who needs to be involved to try to create that action. What needs to happen in Kampala for it to be leading the way? And we've already heard from national government, from the Department of Works and Transport and from NAMIA, but there needs to be a contextual strategy which improves transparency and decision making. We need to involve state and city government, the unions, the branches, local unions, local operators, users, local banks, non-users, the media and civil society. And this sort of approach requires the development of a multi-level and multi-stakeholder participatory 
and consensual process about how to improve motorcycle transport in Kampala. And whilst the barriers to action are evident at all levels and across all stakeholders, research has shown that there is a way forward that can bring together the groups and address the barriers that we've identified here. Next, please, William. So our recommendations are, and these are really points for discussion because as the last speakers, we need to allow points from the floor that actually we need to move from the knowledge that we've seen today that's evident in these many powerful studies to setting up participatory processes with some of those key individuals. On our study, we were looking at Boda Bodas, but there are also, as various other people have mentioned, as Paul mentioned, hawkers and perhaps waste management people, traffic policemen too. But we need to set up that participatory processes between the representatives of key vulnerable groups and the authorities to explore measures for Boda Boda riders in particular and others to reduce their own, their own exposure. We need collective action. Boda Bodas have, have powerful and influential associations. And so how do we strengthen their mechanisms for joint working with uh, the Department of Works and Transport, Ministry of Works and Transport, and also KCCA? How do we ensure that Boda Boda interests are represented in transport policy? And how do we encourage Boda Boda riders to join stages, their stopping points, to record stage location and encourage um, stages to promote good practice, perhaps in vehicle maintenance. And finally, our last discussion point, I'm there, Jake. Um, despite these longer term questions about the role of commercial motorcycle transport in growing cities like Kampala, we have to remember that measures to limit border border operations should recognize their critical importance in urban livelihoods and urban poverty reduction. And Boda Boda riders told us that they frequently have nephews staying in their households. They send money to their parents in ginger and rural areas. And we need to protect those livelihoods and, and make things safer for people who are exposed in vulnerable hotspots. So I hope that's given us uh, given some thought for discussion as we move on to the next stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Alison and William. It certainly has uh, a fantastic stakeholder map. In fact, uh, I've, I've taken out of that a really uh, detailed look at uh, the various roles and responsibilities of the immense range of stakeholders who have something to contribute uh, to uh, air quality management. And uh, a sense I, I, did, I picked up of the need for a common ambition and uh, mechanisms to work together more effectively to understand each other's perspectives and also the the strength of the evidence base, which we've seen is coming through. Um, I'm going to try the impossible here. We really have almost no time for questions, I'm afraid, but I'm going to ask a, number, a few people to give me 30 second responses, if I can. I'm going to start with you, Francis. Um, what would you say were some of the, the tactical solutions that we can implement uh, as organizations to solve air quality really in the next, in the shorter term, as opposed to some of the perhaps the longer term transitions? Uh, in Kampala, I think paving roads will make a big difference and slightly longer term. I think it's just a realisation of that population that is going to come uh, and just everyone needs to appreciate that it is coming now and it's coming quickly. Thank you, Francis. Paul, um, from the perspective of air quality monitoring, well, uh, we have a question uh, from the floor which is about how one um, deploys air quality monitoring systems in cities. Um, what what are the sort of takeaways from your experience? Yeah, there's a few trends. I mean, citizen science is one where we kind of rely on willing members of the public to take on um, monitoring. But that, the, the problem with that is that it tends to favour a certain type of demographic. So you might actually end up with things looking a little greener than they do. Another temptation is to go for hotspots, which has the opposite effect, where you find that things might actually end up looking a lot worse than they do. Uh, we, as, a, as our plug, we're trying to use machine learning and AI to, to optimize device location. So to keep the cost down is to, if we can put 15 devices in carefully selected, optimized locations rather than 50 in a, you know, in every corner, then we can be more efficient. 
But the key really in a, in a word is diversity, not to put devices in the same places all the time, to put them in green spaces, to put them in high spaces, low spaces, so that you get that ver variation, you get a good overall picture. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, Jennifer, just, just turning to you very briefly, what, what can we do to instill a sense of awareness and perhaps even love for our environment amongst the population in a city like Kampala, uh, particularly where uh, levels of education aren't necessarily um, as high as one might wish? Do you have any thoughts about that, just very briefly? Um. Uh, um, I did not understand you very creating awareness. Is that what you said? Well, a lot of our, a lot of the actions which have been proposed here and, and the direction of travel depends on people, the citizens of a city like Kampala coming along, you know, uh, being motivated to, to get engaged and play their part. And I'm wondering whether Nima has any thoughts about how to instill that sense of environmental awareness. Our, I think uh we've we've had several awareness engagements with uh with the public we have a whole section that does the public awareness a uh, bit of it environmental public awareness that uh, that that is responsible for generating materials for public awareness and all those things and education so as NEMA, there is, uh, uh, we always do engage the public, all, all categories of the public, the communities, the schools. Who, um, uh, we use social media for those, for the elites, for the city dwellers, we use uh, TV, radios. So there are various channels of communication. Uh, which, thank you very much. Which we use to communicate to the public. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I think school education could could very much be part of the answer, as you say. So, look, um, we we're 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 just coming up to time now. So, firstly, can I extend a big thank you to all of our panelists for their great contributions? Really, I've personally learned a lot. I hope those of you who've joined us uh, as the audience for this webinar have have learned, uh, have taken something from this too. Um, I, I'm leaving with a sense of excitement about the possibilities but I'm also leaving with a, a sense of um, realism about the challenges and I think that's been amply uh, conveyed through some of the slides today about where, where our starting point is but yet we're having a conversation and the right actors are talking with one another and some of the solutions whether it's electrification of transport or, or, or many other uh, strategies which we've heard about will surely make a difference in the future. However I'd like to leave um, Gabriel to uh, see if he could just sum up in, in a minute um, any of the key takeaways that he's obtained from today's webinar. And, uh, and also, Gabriel, any, any questions which, have, which, are, which are leaving on your mind, which we may need to come back to in the future through another webinar or through another engagement process. So a final word from you, Gabriel. Gabriel, are you there? I think you might be on mute. Gabriel, are you are you with us? I think you might be on mute. Gabriel, I think, has not been able to join us, but never mind. Um, it's three minutes after time, and I would love to just thank you all again, especially the audience for coming with us on this webinar and all of the panelists. And I'm sure all the thought provoking comments will mean that we have to reconvene and continue this process in due course. Thank you all very, very much indeed. Goodbye.